Hello again, it's Matthew from Matthew North Music here. Now, this video today is about this amplifier, the LPCO AC88. Now, I made a video about this a few weeks ago where I did some basic restoration work to get this ready for playing gigs because I love the tone of this amp and it sounds, it just sounds great. And I want to be able to use this live. Now, I did some preliminary work in the last video. This video is a kind of an update because since I did that work, I've done several other things to the amp as well to improve it in terms of stability and efficiency. And I can safely say now I've got a really great sounding amp that does the absolute business. Um, you may have noticed that there's a couple of labels on here because I've got the impedance set permanently on the amp. Um, I've also, you can see the case has actually been painted. And on the back of it, you can see I finally got the old uh, D's, uh, mains AC, sorry, not DC, <laughs> the old mains AC in the back. And now this amp is terrific. And in this video, I'm gonna show you a few things I did to this amp and also a couple of music clips of this being used in a live situation. I've just cleaned the cabinet and if you see, the, the paint had been flaking off quite a lot. So I've, I've rubbed it all down. And on the front, you can see there, I've uh, moved the paint, taken off the badge. I've also taken off the handle and rubbed everything down. And I'm now gonna paint the cabinet. Now, what am I gonna paint it with? Well. I'm going to use some ordinary metal hammerite. I used this before on the other AC88 that I had, and it looked pretty much like it was new at the factory. So I'm just going to go and paint it now. I can actually compare the two. Here's the original panel here, and here's the one I've painted. So the one I've painted is slightly darker, but it's close enough as I think. Also, on this panel here, you can see I've glued in a piece of um, plastic and this is just to go over the voltage selector control that I mentioned before. And it slides out, bulges out slightly, so it's not going to be in the way. And it's just a way of just keeping, keeping it safe. And you can just see here, I've just cleaned one of the holding strap covers with some Brasso. And you can see it's not too bad. There's a few marks on it. It's generally pretty shiny. Whereas the one that wasn't cleaned is a very rusty and a bit sorry for itself. So I'm going to give this one a clean as well. I'll just take you through how I change a valve base on an amplifier. This here is our rectifier. And what I will do is I will write down the pin out of it and what's connected to what. I'll also take a photograph as well as a backup. And then I can remove the valve base and put the new one in. So I'm just going to look at the look at it first. So we've got an orange on pin one. Then nothing's connected to pin two. We've got the resistor on pin three. Pin four has got the, four and five have got the heater wires. Then we have nothing. And so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven has got the other HT wire. And then there's nothing else. And there we have our old valve base that's been disconnected. In all fairness, this one's not in too bad condition considering, and I certainly didn't have any problems with poor contacts, but I considered that if I put in a brand new one like this, together with a good quality retainer, of which I didn't have a retainer for the rectifier anyway, then I think this will make the amp a bit more solid and a bit more workable for playing live. Right then, amp purists, look away now because I'm going in with the cone cut. There we go, that's all I needed to do. And now my new valve base fits in perfectly. And added to that will be the strain relief, which will be like that. And then our rectifier valve will stay in place and hopefully not fall out. And there's our rectifier nicely in place. I haven't wired it up yet because one thing with these modern valve bases, it's always suggested that you actually put the valve in first before you solder them. It just makes it easier for then getting the valve in and out afterwards. So I put the valve in place, I'm just gonna solder it up. And there we have our rectifier and our two output valves, both with their new 
bases and spring retainers. It would appear I haven't documented everything that I've done on this amplifier on video. And now I will take you through everything else that I've done on this amp. These three valves here are the three ECC 83s. The front valve is the input valve for channels one and two. That's like their preamp. This valve here then takes those signals and the uh, gram input, which is at a higher level, so it doesn't need a preamp valve. And it also then feeds the tone control circuit. Then it comes into this valve here, and this is the phase splitter. Now these valve bases were slightly different to the originals in that they were rotated. So I actually had to extend some of the wires, which I'll show you in a minute on the underside. But they do have these rather nifty uh, valve covers. So it keeps the valves in place when, they're, when the amp's being transported. So that, along with the spring retainers on the other valves, means that there's, it's much more efficient. On this side of the amplifier, you can see I've put in my IEC main socket. This is a fused one. So the fuse here, the three original three amp L Pico fuse has actually been disconnected because the problem is with the metal panel on the back, it wouldn't be difficult to, if you had very thin fingers, to poke, poke your finger in and get a belt off it. Or more likely if, say, I don't know, the end of a guitar string or something that hadn't been coiled up got poked in there. Highly unlikely, I know, but I'm not going to take that risk. So I got all that nice and neatly replaced. OK, I'm holding this up with my lamp now in the hope that you can actually see this better. Now, these are our three preamp valves, and you can probably see there's a lot of new stuff here. I've had to replace many resistors and capacitors, and that's where the sleeving comes in, just to give it some extra insulation. Uh, the, here you can see on this wire, for example, I've actually extended it because of the fact that the valve base was rotated so that the cables weren't quite long enough. Now, the other day I watched a video by Phaso Electronics on YouTube and she does a brilliant channel on fixing amps. And she mentioned that if you get a lot of crackle appearing, that's usually iffy plate resistors, which are these resistors here. So I actually replaced many of those and sure enough, all the crackle went. The kind of final problem I had on the preamp circuit was I had one resistor that had gone microphonic and that was this uh, plate resistor here. And so actually that wasn't, that's a cathode. I also had a problem with a resistor that had gone microphonic, which I think was this cathode base resistor here. So I replaced that one as well and altogether it had taken away any sort of bad noise. So this amp now has fairly minimal hum and certainly for an amp from 1963, it's probably got less hum than it had when it was new out of the factory. So I was very pleased with all of this work here and it's remained mechanically very solid and hopefully that's a good sign for things to come. Before I get to the power amp section, I'll just mention the phase inverter section, which is here. The only things I replaced here was that capacitor and that capacitor. Everything else seemed to work okay. And so I thought I'd just leave that. And certainly if you listen to the amp with the preamp valve taken out, you, don't, you hear no noise at all. So that would suggest the whole power amp section was working fairly efficiently. These are our power amp valves here. And once again, you can see because I've had to replace a couple of wires, they're not the same colours that the originals were. However, it was only really the heat up the heater wires, the wires that feed the um, output transformer okay, although I did put some extra sleeving on here just to make it a bit safer. The last bit I'll mention, if you can see it, there's our new mains input socket. The ground there is going to the ground terminal there. The negative is coming off here and then the plus is going under here up to our switch and then back to the transformer. So all of that is now neatly wired in and this amp is sounding great. It really is sounding brilliant. And uh, here's a little clip.
I hope you like this video. I'm a massive fan of this amp and you can still find these on eBay in places. The price of them is creeping up though and you don't see as many of the early versions as you do with the later version. The later version, as you know, is already been badged up as the Sound City Studio 20 and it's effectively the same amp, although the schematic doesn't quite tally up with what was actually inside of here. Although I used the Sound City schematic for when I was working this out for changing components. However, they of course have a printed circuit board inside of them, which it swings in roundabouts. Yes, I prefer point to point wiring, but printed circuit board is much easier for changing components because you literally just desolder a component, put another one in. Anyway, it's been great fun doing this. It's not a job for the faint hearted and it's not a job for people that are just learning how to do this skill. I've been in electronics and I've been working in this type of work for 30 years of my life plus. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you do, please like and subscribe. More videos coming on the way, including a very, very nifty little amp building video that I've started doing. And yeah, leave any comments if you like, any questions about these amps, and please follow me on social media as well. Anyway, thanks for watching, and look forward to making the next video for you.